Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pacific Plunder session of GIJC 2021. My name is Andrea Ho, and I'm this session's moderator. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm joining you from today. I'm in Sydney, in Australia, which is the traditional land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. You can see that behind me. I pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. And I want to extend a particular welcome to our First Nations journalists from around the world who are joining this session today. Some housekeeping now. This session is going to be around 75 minutes long. It's being recorded and it will be available to you to view on demand via the GIJC conference page. So if you wish, you can see it again. And if you think another delegate should see it, then why not direct them to this page for this session on the conference website later on? I'd like you to take a look at your screen now. You can see that there's a chat space over to the right. So feel free to say hello. And this is also the space in which you can ask questions of today's panel. So when a question occurs to you, just write it in the chat space and our chat coordinators will feed them through to me later in the session. If you have any technical difficulties at any time, you can contact the support conference help desk via the link at the top of the conference page. You can see it, it says, need help, get support. I think that's all we need to get started. So to properly introduce myself now, I'm Andrea Ho. And I'm the Director of Education at the Judith Nielsen Institute for Journalism and Ideas. My background is in broadcast journalism at Australia's national public broadcaster, the ABC, where I was a radio producer and then a presenter, an editorial manager and executive leader. The Judith Nielsen Institute, or JNI as we like to call it, is still very young. We're just two years old. Our mission is to support and celebrate quality journalism and informed debate. And given our location in the world, we have a very strong interest in journalism in Asia and the Pacific. Today, we'll hear from three speakers, all journalists who worked on Pacific Plunder. They will each talk about their own role in this large body of work and tell you how they did their work. They'll speak one by one, and after their presentations, I'll invite them back to, to join us around a virtual table where I'll ask your questions from the chat and I'll also add in some broad questions of my own. But first, I want to set the scene. The Pacific region covers the world's largest ocean, linking countries in Australia, Australasia, Southeast and East Asia, South America, Central and North America, and it's positioned between the superpowers of China and the United States. The Pacific is rich in resources, but its natural environment is in peril from the immediate dangers of climate change. The Pacific peoples have distinct ancient cultures, but they've also experienced historic and recent colonisation. So in short, the Pacific is an intensely interesting region where there is much material for original investigative journalism, but the challenges of doing this work are many. In essence, Pacific Plunder is a major series of investigative reports and data journalism involving journalists at Guardian Australia, working with Pacific-based reporters in Bougainville, Cook Islands, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, Palau, Solomon Islands, Samoa, Vanuatu, and more. So you can imagine such a project doesn't just randomly happen. Guardian Australia spent two years focused on the region through their Pacific project, hiring a Pacific editor who we at Jay and I were proud to support with a grant. Today, our speakers will talk about the challenges and benefits of doing the investigative journalism that has produced Pacific Plunder. Our first presenter will be Kate Lyons, followed by Bernadette Cam and then Josh Nicholas. But first, understanding the physical geography and socio-political arrangement of the Pacific really is key to reporting thoroughly on the region. I know many of us here today have experience in working in small rural communities or remote locations, but I have to say the Pacific takes remote reporting to a whole new level. It has profound impacts on the way investigative journalism is done. So before we delve into Pacific Plunder, I'd like to ask our presenter, panellist, journalist, uh, journalist Bernadette Carrion to describe the region for us. And Bernadette, I'll pop up a slide that Josh has prepared, prepared for us showing the Pacific region. So can you just talk us through what we're looking at? Yes. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Bernadette and I am located in Palau. It's a small island of um, 18,000 population 
and Palau is in the westernmost island of the Pacific Island countries. And as you can look in the map, you know, the Pacific are similar islands surrounded and dependent on the ocean and face climate change threat. But it has their own unique culture and languages. We're geographically separated from one another. Um, I live in Palau, but my story took me to Kiribati, which is um, located really miles, thousands of miles away from Palau. Um, I live in Micronesia, they call it Micronesia, and Micronesians or the countries like FSM, RMI, Palau are affiliate, affiliated with the USA, while the other islands are with um, Australia, New Zealand, British, and France. Thank you very much, Benedette. So this gives you an idea of the distance between each of these islands. If you can imagine, I think you know how large Australia is. And uh, if you can to compare your own country to Australia, you get the idea then of how far away these islands are from each other. So it, I want you to keep that in mind as each of our speakers speak today. Now I'd like to introduce the first of our speakers. Kate Lyons leads the Pacific Project at The Guardian Australia which is enabled, as we said, through a grant from the Judith Nielsen Institute. Kate was previously a journalist and live blogger on Guardian Australia's Foreign Desk, where she anchored live coverage of breaking world news and reports on Asia and the Pacific. She's also worked at The Guardian UK on, special, on the special projects team. So she's a very experienced journalist and I welcome her now. Morning, Kate. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending our session uh, to hear about this project. It's something I'm incredibly proud of. Um, it was a huge body of work and um, it, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to be able to talk to you about it and to talk about the Pacific, which is such a fantastic and fascinating part of the world. Um, and as Bernadette and Andrea just mentioned, it is uh, got this huge geographic spread. Um, and though we talk about it as a region, the Pacific, it's a little bit like talking about Africa or Europe in that there's commonality, uh, there's some shared history, there's there are regional bodies, um, and there's often some solidarity um, among the nations, but they're incredibly diverse, it's an incredibly diverse region, unique cultures, um, we're hundreds of languages, you know, we're talking hundreds of languages in Papua New Guinea alone, so hundreds of languages across the region um, and the commonality but also a huge amount of difference and distance, um, which makes reporting very, very interesting. So um, the Pacific is also a region that is hugely underreported um, and this was something that was identified and is sort of the impetus for the Pacific project which I lead at The Guardian, um, and lucky me, what an amazing job to get to lead it. Uh, because it, it really is a region where there isn't much international news presence at all. So across all Australian media outlets, and keeping in mind Australia is in the Pacific, it's our region, it's where we live and it, you know, sit, there is one foreign correspondent based in the region, and that's uh, the ABC, our national broadcaster, has a correspondent in Papua New Guinea. And thank God they do. She's amazing. She does amazing work. Um, and long may she stay there or somebody stay there doing that reporting. But that's not much. And it's especially not much when you think like Papua New Guinea is a quarter of a globe away from some of the eastern countries or territories in the region. Um, it's very difficult for her to sort of just jump on a plane and get to Kiribati or to, you know, New Caledonia or Tahiti or wherever it is that that coverage uh, needs to happen. So it's a very underreported region. When it is reported, often there can be some, uh, or there have been some sort of tropes, um, some stories that institutions fall into when they're reporting about the region that aren't always um, accurate and aren't always that helpful um, or don't give a huge amount of credit to the Pacific region. So there are things like, um, you might get the same same stories that get told, you know, tribal violence in Papua New Guinea or trouble in paradise um, or as if it's a surprise that because they're extremely beautiful nations but are many of them developing nations that they have social and economic problems, things like that that sometimes um, are, don't, don't give sort of full credit to the nuance and, and richness and diversity of the region. And the other uh, issue that comes up sometimes is 
the fact that the Pacific sometimes is reported through the lens of other countries. So it's the Pacific is reported as a geopolitical football to be kicked around between the US and China. You know, it is sort of this blank canvas or this sort of blank field in which the US and China or Australia and China sort of work out their tug of war for influence and power um, without sort of thinking about the fact that when we do stories on debt trap de trap diplomacy in China that often Pacific leaders know exactly what they're getting into when they accept that money from China and they're willing to take the risks in order to get the building or to you know secure the roads or the schools or whatever it is. Um, so there are some sort of stories that get told that sometimes make it not, um, you know, that don't reflect the views of Pacific people. Um, and then, but, but the Pacific is an incredibly important news arena. And it is uh, important because it is this, this space where China and Australia, China and the US are playing out these sort of um, battles for influence. That, that is an important subject. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative is a big story in the region. That's an important one to tell. But it's also an important region to report on because it's an interesting, vibrant, vital region full of fascinating stories that deserve to be told. Um, a key story of the region and a, and a reason it should be making headlines everywhere, and I really hope it, it does, is that the Pacific is the region at one of the regions, if not the absolute um, first affected by climate change, first and worst affected by climate change. So sea level rises have occurred in some parts of the Pacific at two to three times the level of the global average. There, it's full of low-lying atolls um, that are already uninhabitable, that have, people have already been forced to flee because of rising sea levels. Climate change means that some low-lying atoll nations, particularly Tuvalu, which is very, very small, may well not exist this century. That's just huge and staggering and is worthy of telling that story, also worthy of telling the story of the incredible um, fight that the climate, um, the, the climate sort of warriors that emerge from the Pacific. A huge amount of what we have in the Paris Agreement, for instance, a lot of pushing for high ambition on climate comes from Pacific leaders. Um, those are stories that are really worth telling um, and worth telling loudly and often, I think. Um, but it's a fascinating part of the world world, heaps of news, lots of news to tell, and not many foreign journalists or foreign media outlets with a sort of stake in the ground to tell those stories. And it's that space that The Guardian stepped into two years ago when we launched the Pacific Project with the support of the Judith Nielsen Institute. It was this recognition of this sort of news vacuum with some obvious and very commendable exceptions. Um, and our vision for that was to have a network of Pacific journalists doing the reporting. So I'm the Pacific editor, and it's such a treat to do that job. And my job is, has been and is to build a network of Pacific journalists like Bernadette, who you just heard from and will hear more from, who are based in the region, who know the region deeply, who have connections, um, and who can tell the stories of their own countries, of their own islands. Um, and so to build them up and support them, to pay them, to train them um, and to get the stories out there. It has meant that we have over the last two years done a lot of Pacific journalism. Um, I'm going to share my screen and just show you a few little examples now. So this is the Pacific Project homepage. You can see these are the sorts of stories that we do. We do daily news. We do long-term features. We do um, podcasts. We do videos like this one. We look at the news of COVID. We've covered that very extensively as it sort of crippled the region economically. We look at environmental concerns, all sorts of things, as well as beautiful, joyful, fun stories, you know, lifestyle and culture stories from the region. Um, we have produced many hundreds, I, I've lost count, but hundreds of stories, including some really big moments. Bougainville's referendum was a really early event uh, for us and covering that. Um, we, looking at the COVID crisis in Papua New Guinea, um, I actually saw that the author of this report, Gala Laini, is on this call. So hi, Gala. Um, thank you for your amazing contributions to this, to this project. Uh, we look at the politics of the region. This is Samoa's first female prime minister giving her first foreign sit-down interview with our brilliant um, reporter, Samoa-based reporter. Um, and on we go. There are more stories I can tell you, you know, stories that need highlighting. The 
persecution of LGBT uh, people in the region, um, dramatic events. This is one from Bernadette about a, a very shocking murder in a very sleepy island in, a, in Federated States of Micronesia. Um, we also have had some special series that we focused on. This is one that was quite recent and one I'm incredibly proud of. Uh, it was a series, a podcast series that we did focusing on the impossible choice, as it's called, that a lot of islanders are having to make as their islands become less and less inhabitable um, and more and more dangerous because of climate change. And how do you as an individual, as a family, as a community, as a country, reach that point of decision where you say, I'm so connected to this land. It is my spiritual home. It is my ancestors' home. It is my culture. It is myself, but I have to leave because of climate change. And it's a very human, compelling um, a, a bit of reporting, which is hosted by our brilliant um, Langapui, the Sherelle Jackson, a brilliant Samoan reporter, uh, with more reporting from Gala Lina in there. I'm just seeing her piece, um, her piece here from the Sarposa Islands off Papua New Guinea, um, which are uninhabitable, which people are having to leave. And you can see this beautiful images that she's she's taken. So as well as this, we've been doing this for two years with a lot of reporting and a lot of um, a lot of stories, but we also want to focus on uh, investigative reporting as part of our reporting um, process that we do. And we've done a number of investigations over the time. Uh, an early one was uh, an investigation into the Prisons Commission of Commissioner of Fiji, who is the brother-in-law of the Prime Minister, who it was alleged by four whistleblowers who used to work in the prison system, ordered them to beat and, in their words, torture inmates and actually other guards as well. Um, that was an incredibly brave um, thing to them, for them to come forward and incredibly brave reporting from our Fijian journalist um, who, uh, you know, there, there are risks to our reporters for doing this sort of reporting um, and it's incredibly brave work that he did. Uh, we've also looked at uh, baby selling scheme, um, Marshall Islands, women lured to the US to give birth and give up their children for adoption. We did a major investigation earlier this year into citizenship um, golden passport scheme in Vanuatu, selling passports to some uh, very, very questionable people, warlords and drug dealers and former bikies and all sorts of people. And then, of course, we have Pacific Plunder, which is a major investigative series that The Guardian launched earlier this year. It ran for a month um, and it focused on the extractive industries in the Pacific region. So it started here. This is the earliest, uh, the day one launch uh, material. And the reason we wanted to do that is because when you look at the Pacific, when you talk to people from the Pacific, you hear the same story told over and over and over across different islands, across different countries. And the story goes something like this. I'm going to stop sharing now. You can, I think Josh is going to take you through stories in more detail in a second. But um, the story goes something like this. There's a small, there's an island in the Pacific. It's quite poor, but it's rich in natural resources. A big foreign logging or mining company comes in. They reach a landowner, an agreement with the landowners that may or may not be legitimate. Um, some landowners get very wealthy. Most don't. They do a lot of logging and mining. They take all of these resources. Very little of that money goes to um, the government or goes to the local people. And then they leave um, in their wake, enormous environmental devastation and social harm. And you just hear that story, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, just all over, you hear it again and again and again. And we wanted to look at what actually um, the complete story was across the region. Now that's a difficult thing to do in the Pacific for a few reasons. One is data is, the Pacific is rich in many things, but it is not rich in data. And so getting hold of data that actually showed, quantified this problem was extremely difficult. And that's where Josh, our data wizard, did an amazing job. So, and it was fraught. It was a real jigsaw puzzle of trying to pull together data that could paint this picture. It's also very difficult because this is quite a dangerous subject to tell, um, to talk on. So we know that environmental journalism comes with enormous risks often for the journalists, that when there is big business and a lot of profit to be made um, from environmental deals, that that actually can um, lead to a lot of danger for journalists. And we needed to, to be really careful of that as we were commissioning and working on this series. And uh, 
The other challenge is to do with logistical challenges. As Andrea mentioned, um, it's things like getting to a remote island when there's one flight every fortnight and that gets cancelled when the wind is bad. The number of times I've had journalists slated to go on trips to islands and they can't because the sea is rough and they just can't get there. I have had four times in the time I've been doing this job a journalist not file or file up to a month late because of cyclones. I've also had times where they can't file because of things like understandable cultural um, things that have happened. You know, there's been a death in my village. No one's allowed to work for the month. So that's it. We're in lockdown. Like whole stories get sort of cancelled for those reasons. We had one example in this series. Uh, we sent out Solomon Islands journalist and photojournalist to Wagina Island, remote island. And um, while there, the camera guy's camera broke. And it was just, that was it. It was broken. He was many, many, many hundreds of kilometres from a camera shop or a camera repair place. So that was it. He, it was just just that we had no photos. Fortunately, he had a video camera and we got beautiful drone footage, but that's the sort of thing that happens and you sort of just have to roll with with the Pacific. So some real logistical challenges, um, but also it made it all the more satisfying and sweet when this project came together. Oh, and I should say, so the project ended up being ran over a month it was, I think, nearly 20 pieces of work. I featured the work. It was a huge team effort. Uh, it was edited by both me and Ben Doherty, who was Pacific editor while I was on maternity leave. We sort of passed it back and forth between us. I started it. He did it while I was on leave. I came back and took it over um, the data team. And then I, we had about a dozen Pacific journalists in different countries contributing to it as well. Um, so it was a huge piece of work and something fantastic. And back to you, Andrea. Thank you so much, Kate. It was really good to get a sense of how you found your way to Pacific Plunder and to see what uh, Guardian Australia has done in the lead up to that, which is terrific. And to get a sense too of what the major challenges are in reporting and learning to report better on the Pacific as well. So you talked about uh, two things which will form the, the next two speakers, I think, and, and their talks for us. So we'll have a look at the data journalism piece in a moment with uh, Josh. But I do in, um, but first we'll talk to Bernadette uh, Carrion uh, on I think the logistics and the, the, the personal aspects of reporting uh, in the islands as well. And I want to remind everybody who's on this session today to please put some, some uh, um, questions in the chat. It, it, based on what you've heard Kate talk about, have a capture your questions now before you forget them, put them in the chat and we'll come to them a little bit later on. But now it's time for me to introduce our next speaker today. Bernadette Carrion, who you've already seen just very briefly on the screen, is a journalist based in Palau. Now she writes for several regional and international publications. Bernadette's been a journalist for 22 years. She was born and raised in Manila, in the Philippines, where she studied journalism at the University of Santo Tomas and began her journalism career in 1999, working for publications Today and Malaya. Now, she came to Palau in, 2020, in 2001 to work for the now defunct Palau Horizon publication, but she stayed and she now considers Palau to be her home. Bernadette's done investigative pieces on fisheries and the environment. She's also a media trainer who's conducted training on economy, election, disaster preparedness, uh, information integrity and fact-checking for journalists in Palau. She's one of the network of journalists partnering with Guardian Australia's Pacific Projects. I'd like to say hello now to Bernadette. Hi, hello. Um, it's the, I have joined the Pacific project in 2019 and i started the story about the murder in yap and from them from then on i do mostly um short pieces news breaking news but then there there is a story that's always close to my heart um which is the fisheries stories and as kate have said um pacific is poor but it's a rich ground rich fishing ground and then they were always talking about how um, the fishing uh, brings the Pacific um, millions in revenues. And then along the, along, as I report about fisheries, there's one um, topic that I, that um, probably, I would say bothers me, is that they always boast about, oh, the fisheries sector is rich in Palau. It brings it brings Palau. It brings the Pacific um, revenues, millions, monies. But then there's one aspect that 
is being forgotten or being neglected is the plight of fisheries observers. You know, they they go at sea for months and they no, don't know anyone. And usually they are at sea with fishing crew that don't speak the same language. So in early 2020, I pitched the story to Kate and I was thinking that it will only be, you know, some small piece of news, um, some breaking news about the death of a Kiribati fisheries observer. But then as, as I collaborated with Kate, with her help, um, having a premise is good, but then I, start, I started to do research on the premise. And I think for the first time, I allowed the story to find its own way. And then there are facts that I stumbled upon and, and I, it started to, it started to be, um, I started creating uh, a story that has human dimension. Um, I think I make this mistake uh, that sometimes I pre precondition my story. I precondition it in my mind that um, this is a story. This is the ending of my story. But in case of the fisheries of service death, it's something that's like an onion where it got killed, layers and layers got killed until um, I created with the help of Kate um, a really powerful story about the fisheries observer and his family. And I'm reporting from Palau and the fisheries observer and his family are located in Kiribati. So um, you might imagine how challenging it is because of COVID-19. I couldn't probably travel to Kiribati and I'm not sure if traveling to Kiribati will be safe. And also there's also an issue of internet connection. Um, the sister of Eritara, the fisheries observer who died, lives in Solomon Island where she, where she has a poor connection. And then I also interviewed some um, NGO from the US, from the UK. So yes, um, complex, this story being complex is an understatement. And also it's, it's very challenging. This is the first um, kind of stories I've done. And I, I've said this many times, I'm working in a small island, we have smaller newsroom. At one point in my career, I was doing, I was reporting the story. I was going out on the field. I was taking pictures. I'm editing my story. I'm putting the paper to bed. So when uh, Pacific Project came and I met Kate, it was um, a relief that I could collaborate with someone who will look into my story, who will help me um, make it a really powerful piece. Bernadette, thank you. You've raised some really interesting points, I think, about capacity building and particularly capacity building for journalists where your current state is, as you said, uh, you are a one-man band. You do everything and the opportunity to raise your own practice is not something that you're going to get doing your current job. And so working in a collaborative environment is potentially an opportunity to change what you do. So I think that if you've got, again, any questions around um, this kind of work about how to achieve a good partnership around capability building, pop them in the chat now and we'll get to those a little bit later on. But I hope that you saw that Deaths at Sea, the fisheries inspectors who never came home, that story on uh, the screen. It was one of the first of Bernadette's stories that I read and I found it incredibly moving at the time and even just looking at it now, uh, I'm still incredibly moved by it. It's the kind of story which you wouldn't know about unless you read Bernadette's story. So congratulations on that uh, investigative report. It's one of the stories that makes up the uh, Pacific Plunder uh, body of work and it's also, I think, one of the pieces that actually gives the Pacific Plunder uh, a human face, if you like. But the thing that gives the Pacific plunder its impact is its data. So combining the human face with the data, as Kate says, it makes a complete picture. 
And so that, I think, now gives us a way in which to introduce Josh Nicholas. Josh is a data journalist at The Guardian Australia. He's previously been an economics editor, technology journalist and executive producer of a national current affairs radio show. I can say that that is not something to be underrated. He's taken the lead on the data sourcing and data visualisation which underpin the investigation and which bring the analysis to life. And just as um, uh, Bernadette joined us from Palau a short while ago, uh, Josh is joining us from Sri Lanka today where I think it's only just on sunrise. So particular thanks to you, Josh, for getting up nice and early and joining us. Yeah, hello everyone. It's actually a lovely morning. I wouldn't want to be doing this at 1 p.m. when it's 30 something degrees and 90 something percent humidity. Um, so yes, I this was a sort of a clean slate project for me, which I found quite quite a challenge because you know I, I'd, I'd been to a couple of places in the Pacific, but on holiday. I'd been to Vanuatu, I'd been to Fiji, and you know I, I read Kate's reporting and I, I read some of the other things in Australia, but a lot of it was just invisible to me. So when when um, you know Kate and Ben came to, came to me and said we're, we're going to start this project, and the first step was really just like what can you find? We 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 know that, as Kate said this is this is such a, a big theme in the Pacific. So what a lot of people talk about, but what is the data that we can find? And you know we, we spent a good couple of weeks just like what 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 can we find? And I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a good uh, wait if I can share my screen. I think I can share my screen. So yeah, okay. So this is actually, um, this is one of the first things I did. This is, this is a spreadsheet of Asia Development Bank data. So it's publicly available data. You can go download this for every country almost in Asia, almost in the world, actually. And so I, the first step I wanted to find was how many people are employed in all of these industries in all of these countries? And when you start going through them, you see these gigantic gaps, you know, like here, here Palau reported their data in 2000, then in 2005, there's a four-year gap. For some of these countries, there can be like 13-year gaps between them reporting data to the ADB. And so it's kind of indicative of these are these are the problems we find. There often is data, but it could be 10 years old. It could be 20 years old. It could be for some parts of a country. It could be for some countries, not others. And so then you start getting into a real, real problem when you start trying to do like a a big picture view of what's happening in the Pacific, and you only have like Papua New Guinea, who has amazing data, I think, and Fiji has amazing data on some things, but then you don't have Palau, or you don't have Kiribati, or you don't have someone else, you can't really take that view. So um, oh, here's my, here's my, I'm not, I'm not going to go into presenting mode. Um, so when, when I first started approaching this, I was sort of thinking of the data in a couple of, in a couple of levels. One is sort of centralized data. In, in Australia, you know, I, I'm working on a story about um, climate change right now. And I know the data exists. It's probably public. It's probably been published by, you know, the ABS or the Environment Department or something. Often when I'm trying to get data in Australia, it's just going to a government website and downloading the data. But when you start operating in countries like Sri Lanka or in the Pacific, the data, it's probably collected somewhere. It's probably all not in one place. And you start having to go through to more decentralized forms of data because someone is probably collecting this somewhere. The question is, can I find the person who's collecting the data? And you start having to be a bit more creative. Like I was downloading any report by, published by anyone I could find and just going through the bibliography. I, I was emailing any academic I could find, you know, University of South Pacific, ANU in Australia. I, I was emailing people in like the Netherlands who had done like fishing reports before, like, can we find data on how many tons are being, of, of uh, fish are being extracted in country X? And once you start hitting on the people who really care about this stuff, I, I came across one, um, I think it was an ANU, one professor, who had been tracking the logging exports in Solomon Islands for 30 something years and hadn't done anything with it. And so often, often the data sources we were finding were like people like that. They, they'd been just been collecting all these PDFs or collecting all this whatever. They hadn't done anything with it. And you can only find them because you find someone who finds someone who finds someone who's like, oh, this guy has been doing this for 20 years. So that is often the challenge in the Pacific that I'm um, Kate would know this so well, Bernadette would know this so well. So we kind of had a couple of, we had a couple of different levels of data. We had the centralized agencies like the ADB, 
like the central banks of the various countries. We were getting some some data from them, some patchy data from them. Um, Kate and I did a, I think one of my favorite stories in the series was about taxation of gold miners in, in the Pacific. And for that, because most of the countries were Australian, actually the data was great because we were just getting it all from their annual reports published in Australia. But that you know you can also get very similar reports. Stock exchanges are great. They have really strict rules. So often you can find quite granular data, very, very consistent. Um, and then, then the next level after that, after sort of the old school data process where we're just finding people who might have stuff, we're to start getting a bit more creative. We're to start scraping websites. We're to start scraping databases. I, for most of the data gathering process, I was talking to journalists in, in the Pacific and one of them tipped me off that there's a, like a, an SME database in the Solomon Islands. And everyone I talked to was telling us that um, the Malaysian companies were really, really big in logging in the, in the Pacific, especially in the Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. We could not find anything. It was just like, everyone knows this is true, but we just couldn't find anything. So I started thinking, okay, we have this, this database of, of, um, of companies. Can we just scrape the database? Can we just get anything out of the database? And this actually, this image here on the side was my code. <laughs> So I wrote a little script that basically just searched the database, kept going, kept searching, and just pulling all of the names I could get out of the database. And fortunately, we, we were unable to penetrate one further, but I have an amazing network of all these people who run or own logging companies in the Solomon Islands. So you kind of have to get really crazy with this. Now, another one that Kate and I couldn't land, but we were, we were looking at a, an Australian company that had been mining in Papua New Guinea for like 50 years. So we had like 50 years of annual reports. Almost half of them were handwritten. You know, they're from the, like the 1950s. And it was all handwritten, like their accounts. And so I was, I was building a scraper to try and recognize what are all the numbers in, in, these, in these old handwritten documents. And it was incredible, some of the numbers we were pulling out, like millions of tons of waste from, this, from these mines in Papua New Guinea. Um, so you kind of have to be very creative. You have to find weird people who are doing stuff. You have to scrape random databases. You have to figure out how to pull out numbers from handwritten documents. This is often the challenge when you're w working in companies that don't have like an amazing resource statistical agency like the ABS in Australia. Like I really, really appreciate the ABS in Australia now. Like how lovely all the data they, <laughs> they give me is. Um, so th that was a lot of the process of, of it was just it was just a hard slog. It was just finding whoever we could. And then we sort of pivoted into data visualization. And I can show you some of the we had a, we had quite a number of challenges with that as well. So we, we ended up finding this gorgeous data set of exports so we could show where is where is everything going. And we sort of built a lot of the data visualizations about, around that. So this is this map that we created, and you can sort of pick which country and you can see where is where is all of this going and actually i had a i showed this before but this was the first version of this map we, it was just absolutely terrible we had no idea what we were doing and also actually the funny thing is that point all the way near south america there was something broken in our um in our map data and so that's actually wallace and futuna for some reason it was all the way over near like brazil instead of in the pacific where it was meant to be so there was quite a lot of broken things like that. Anyway, this is what we came up with in the end. And this is actually my favorite, still my favorite thing in this, in this uh, thing we created in this series, because you can just see just how ginormous a couple of countries are. Like, look at all of that going to China and Japan. And this is measured by weight. So th these are millions of tons of lumber and fish all going to Japan, all going to Korea, all going to China. And, and then... This this was a, a key thing. I remember Kate and I were talking about this map when we were first creating it. Because if you look at it by dollar value, suddenly Australia becomes this massive, this massive thing. And it's because so much gold is exported to Australia. And so gold weighs nothing, but it's incredibly valuable. So when you look at the different aspects of how this extraction occurs, you start seeing like, you know, by weight it all goes to China, by dollar value, so much of it comes to Australia. And 
the, the, the key thing with that is there's so much pollution and waste created by mining gold. Gold is only a very small thing, but you need tons and tons and tons of waste to create a little bit of gold. Um, the, other big, the other big problem we had as we were creating some of these visualizations is just the massive scale discrepancy. Actually, it's best off in this, in this China story we did about where all the ex exports go. This broke our maps. When you have millions and millions and millions of tons, we couldn't figure out what was wrong with our, with our charts and our maps for quite a while. And then we eventually realized it's just that when China is getting like 80% of it or 60% of it, and the rest of the countries are all getting tiny little slabs, they all start becoming unrecognizable in our, in our charts. And so we, we, had to, we had to fix our charts. We had to find all these workarounds so you could still see, you know, here's the tiny slice that is India compared to the huge slice that is China. And I, don't know, I, guess, I guess the last thing I want to say was just um, a lot of it was about finding, finding ways to just clearly show flows. That's something that's very hard to do in data journalism. It's, it's very easy to go, you know, uh, country X got, you know, 140 tons, just do a bar chart. That's very, very simple. But when you start trying to show where all the flow is going, that's very, very hard. So, we, you know, I became very adept at making Sankeys, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say. Josh, thank you. You've got one more slide there. I don't know whether you want to go to that or not. Oh, that one was just because um, you told us that uh, these people could download these slides. So I just yes. thought, you know, a lot of our ideas, so actually this, this, this map we have, this flow map, that was something where actually my boss, Nick, because um, we were talking about this for quite a while, like how do we show on a map, how do we put a Sankey on a map, basically? So this is a Sankey chart, which just shows a flow between two, two places. And then it was like, how do we do a Sankey on a map? And we... We found this crazy, someone had done this like 30 years ago, but, but we had no idea how to do this. And so Nick, Nick, I don't know, he must have been a weekend or something doing this, um, came up with this and we just slowly, slowly refined it. But then a lot of our other ideas for charts, you know, uh, a lot of people often ask me, like, how do you get ideas for charts? And so these are a lot of the things I look at, you know, almost all of the um, programming languages we use, like uh, JavaScript or Python or R, they all have these amazing galleries you can see of charts people have made I, I you know I love some of the work of our competitors you know like the New York Times and the Financial Times they have amazing data journalism you can just get like you know you may apply it to something completely differently but just you can get lots of ideas from some of these things great thank you it's good to see those I know that quite a few of you are going to have questions to ask of Josh about the data journalism. That was an amazing summary in which he packed in a lot of uh, top line information, but you might want to drill down into some of the techniques and other things that he's talked about. So uh, pop your questions again into the chat and have a look. But now having heard from all three of our speakers, I personally have a much better round sense of uh, Pacific Plunder, how this reporting body of work came together. And so I, I actually want to see whether we can bring all of us around the table onto the screen, all four of us together, if that's possible, and uh, and then um, perhaps ask us a couple of questions. And you guys need to jump in and answer this as you would or answer these as you would. I really just want to sort of uh, find out a little bit more. So we started with the idea, Kate, that you had a sense of the story that you wanted to tell. And then the story was told in either uh, the personal examples through stories like those done by Bernadette or the data uh, that was collected by Josh and that either verified or disproved some of the thoughts that you might have had. How much did your original idea keep driving the journalism and how much did the data that you got from Josh and the stories that you got from Bernadette and the other journalists actually change the shape of the project? Was it all one way or did it actually become circular? It very much in, was informed as we went along by the data and also by the stories that we had we heard. So one good example is that um, we were working on this sort of assumption of extractive industries and, and we'd heard a lot of stories of the damage um, that was done by logging and mining. But one thing that sort of came up was that fishing was a much more complicated story. Um, so as, as we heard in from Bernadette's wonderful story, there's obviously this dark side, which is 
overfishing, um, you know, boats taking more than they should and fisheries observers, quite a large number of them, dying on board fishing vessels as they try to monitor and police the catches and make sure it's all legal um, with big question marks over the circumstances of those deaths. So obviously there's this problematic side, but as we learnt um, from uh, partly the data and just partly doing good old-fashioned journalism, talking to a lot of people and, and getting amazing um, sort of fisheries expert journalists on this story was that fishing is a different story in the Pacific and it's a far more positive story. Um, it's one where the Pacific actually sort of banded together and, you know, almost unionised um, and decided to, to cooperate and establish a much um, fairer system for themselves and so they got a much... Um, more fair share of the profits of fishing in the region. Um, and we tell that story and it's it's a real success story for the region and sort of paints, it offers an example of, of a solution of how um, this might work for other industries or how at least it worked for fishing. Um, so that was an example where uh, that evolved over the course of the project. Um, it became a more complicated, more complicated picture. I think the example that... Um, Josh gave of when you look at the exports by weight, you get a very China focused story. But when you look by value, Australia really comes into the mix as a big player was an important one. And um, that led us to make sure that we had that perspective in the series, that it wasn't just um, China doing the wrong thing, though, though Chinese companies do do the wrong thing in some cases in the region. And that's important to spotlight. Um, but also, you know, we, as Josh said, he and I worked on a story together about the absolute outrageously low amounts of tax that Australian mining companies have paid to Papua New Guinea over the years. Just, just obscene, just absolutely outrageous, legal, but, but very unfair seeming allegedly, you know, with all the caveats that mean that our lawyers, the Guardian won't get crossed with me for this uh, statement. But um, so that was quite important to include, to not make it a, a simplistic story, to make sure we reflected the complications and the, the nuance. Yeah, I agree. When I looked at that reporting and I played with the, uh, with the graphs and I looked at per weight versus per value, it was a really dramatically different story and I thought that that was particularly insightful in the reporting. Uh, shout out to Ben Belua from Island Sun newspaper uh, online in the Solomon Islands. Hi, Ben. Um, Ben's asked Josh whether you might um, drop your uh, email into a, the personal chat with him. He'd like to get in touch with you about the logging data in particular. But also Ben earlier on mentioned something about, um, about the logistics and verifying that logistically, physically, it's hard to move around around the Pacific Islands and the, the things that we take for granted are, oh, look, you know, gosh, this thing's broken on a Sunday, we'll just go down the shops on Monday and we'll get it fixed or whatever. The idea of it being three weeks before you can get a camera apart, uh, if you're lucky, it really just blows my mind. But also you combine that with the small communities and anyone who's worked in a small regional remote community, I have, uh, the fact that you know your neighbours and your neighbours know you and you're doing journalism, that must have some difficulties. And then the fact that potentially if you're doing dangerous work, and we know this is dangerous because, Bernadette, you were reporting on fisheries people who died in suspicious circumstances, doing that kind of work uh, all together in a, in a place where you might not have access to law enforcement for two, three, four weeks is really kind of shocking for me. So can you talk through, Bernadette, a little bit of how you managed your risk in doing this kind of investigative work? And please, Kate, and also Josh, just chime in as part of the conversation, but I want to direct that to you, Bernadette. Um, for this story, I think I've, I've used my experience in reporting fisheries. Um, I build a network of uh, people that I can talk to. And then this story about Eritara and the Dead at Sea, this is, my story is the, not the first time that this story has been highlighted. I mean, it has been written many, many times. But I think the difference with this one is um, with the help of Kate, with the assistance of Kate and with her guidance, we, we went and tried to highlight the family on um, the, how, uh, how they felt, um, what's going to happen to them. And as um, the NGO said, this is about um, like us going to work and 
if we want, if we go to work, we want to be feel protected, right? We want to be to ensure that our employers, when we go to work, they're protecting us. If something happened to us, our family will be um, are will be taken care of. I think I look at this story as something like, um, I try to work for you. I try to to work for this um, most price resource in the Pacific. But are you going to take care of me? Is my life more important than the fisheries? Um, something like that. And so it was difficult. And I know, Kate, it took me like months to um, get this story. And then there's some, some I, I would admit sometimes, oh, is, did I do this story? This is a hard story. I mean, I, I cannot go to Kiribati. No one responds from Kiribati. I tried many times emailing sending stories, but nobody, nobody responds. So we just look into, um, I look into data from the this NGO from um, that takes care of the Association of Pacific Observers and the NGO from the UK. I, and, and it started from there without, um, without their document and them looking into it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how, how I did this story. Until now, I cannot this story but you did clearly Bernadette can I ask you did you ever feel as though you were in danger when you were reporting well I'm not um I'm not in Kiribati I'm in Palau so I always say oh probably I can never go to Kiribati after this <laughs> so, I may Andrea I mean it's one of the reasons that we used Bernadette for this story is not right because she's a fantastic journalist and because she has great experience in fisheries. But um, Bernard has done a couple of stories for us, this one and the one that I shared earlier about the murder of um, the American Attorney General in Yap. Um, and that was part of a risk assessment that I made that Yap is too small mm -hmm. and there were hints that this murder was related to organised crime in um, on the island. It was too small for us to use a Yappies um, journalist and uh, we just made the decision that 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 wasn't safe um, and so Bernadette is in Micronesia you know there's there's a sort of regional affiliation she has connections she's an incredibly um, dogged and diligent and intrepid journalist who could dig out the story from another island but um, sometimes that's the call we make is not to use someone on on the island itself if it is small enough and we assess the level of danger as being too high and the other thing that is really important from my point of view is I really listen to and trust the assessment of risk from the reporter. Um, so some of these reporters are uh, that we use in the Pacific Project are incredibly experienced, um, very, very senior figures in the media um, world in their countries, and I trust their judgment. So if they say, yeah, sure, look, it's logging and it's pretty fraught, but I'm from the area, I know the island, I'm very well connected, no one's going to touch me while I'm there, I might still not send them out by themselves, I might send them out with a big burly male photographer to go with the female journalist, you know, or something like that, and we would have, we have very strict security protocols in terms of check-ins, in terms of when we, when we have the red sirens sort of blaring um, that we haven't had contact for long enough, but um, yeah, I, I listen to the judgment a lot of the of the reporter and sort of work with them to work out a safe plan. And then some stories we we just can't tell. Like there have been some stories that we can't do because it is not safe. And as Bernadette said, you know, the whole premise of her fisheries observer piece was that the lives of fisheries observers were considered secondary to the profit and we have the same burden that the lives of our reporters and the safety and well-being is more important um, than getting the story. And so um, that is a constant consideration for me um, as well when, when commissioning, when coming up with a safety plan for the reporting project and thinking about who we send, how we do it. But there are times where we just have to say this is this is too, too dangerous. You cannot go and meet that, um, you know, Papua New Guinea's most wanted warlord uh, in the bushes for an exclusive interview. That's just not, we, we, can't, we can't do that, I'm sorry, that kind of thing. I hear you on that. That that would that would break every WHS uh, rule that I've ever worked under. You didn't for get sure. over the line that one. Yeah. 
No, I'm quite sure it didn't. Um, we talked earlier, Bernadette, uh, you, you mentioned that working with Kate, working with Guardian Australia gave you an opportunity to raise yourself up out of uh, doing that daily reportage, which just the churn of that can just take up all of your time and it makes it difficult to go and do the um, the deeper investigative reporting. I think this is something which is common for local journalists, regional journalists in lots of different places. I wonder too, though, about the opportunity of a large uh, a large um, collaborative partner like Guardian when you are a small journalist or a solo operator or a freelancer. What are the advantages and disadvantages? And if I might sort of name one or two of each and you can say to me, um, are my assumptions right or wrong? Are there advantages in reaching a, a larger audience, advantages in being able to tap into a legal team, which you might not have as a solo operator? Versus the disadvantages, I mean, I can see, Bernadette, you had your um, byline on this particular story, but as Kate said, you were thousands of kilometres away from where that story was. It was safe for you to put your byline on there. Are there sometimes times when it's not safe to actually be associated with your journalism? So what are the pros and cons of um, working with a larger masthead? Uh, and I happily hear from all of you on this. Um, I think it... it you know, I've been doing journalism. I've been a journalist for 22 years. I think working with the Pacific Project has raised uh, my credibility. And also, it kind of sort of gave me that protection. Like, um, I live in Palau, and I'm not I'm not a Palawan. And even our my Palawan colleagues have challenges because they have this culture that you cannot change your... Um, uncles, you cannot share your auntie, so and your traditional chiefs. So because there will be personal impacts, um, there will be repercussions. So um, I can say that I am the to go to. Oh, like Bernadette, I cannot write this about my uncle. Can you write about this? Can you look into it? Because I have a, I'm I'm not. Um, my editors are from outside. Uh, there's a big, bigger publication um, backing me up. So they cannot, um, they cannot say, oh, okay, Bernadette, hop on on the next plane out of here. So I think the um, working for a bigger um, Masjid or the Guardian or international organization has actually given me protection. I mean, I, I am more confident and I am more, um, I feel safe that nothing's gonna happen to me. It raises the bar and it also, um, it also given the spotlight to the North Pacific and Palau, you know, we, we are small. And I always say this, when, when I go to regional events like Pacific Island Forum, I feel like that there's a disconnect. I feel like, oh, they're talking more about the South Pacific. They're talking about more Melanesia. Why they're not talking about um, the, the Micronesia. So this one, either we're small, e even though we have small, maybe the stories are not as um, impacting internationally, but it spotlighted Palau in the North Pacific. Kate, what's your view? I mean, I, I can see all of that would be true. You sit on the other side of the desk as a commissioning editor. Uh, what were the pros and cons for, for you working with a team in the Pacific? Only pros. Um, it's it's fantastic working with the team. I, I don't think, I think you could have done this series without Pacific journalists involved, but it would be a much, much poorer series. It would have been a fantastic data series. Um, and who knows, maybe we wouldn't have even pursued it because we weren't hearing the stories from the Pacific that prompted us to want to look into the data. Um, but you certainly wouldn't have got the the human stories, you wouldn't have got the amazing accounts from Wagina Island, the beautiful photo essay from Rennell Island, it's just these, these things that brought it to life and really um, had the emotional impact to say, okay, well, all of this, all of these forests have been cleared, but what, you know, who cares kind of until you see a community that has been raised and is, you know, that there's no drinking water uh, and the children, are, you know, like because of the impacts of the logging and the mining. Um, Genuinely, it's a, it's a joy to work um, with Pacific reporters who I think do incredible, incredibly brave um, and also incredibly difficult, uh, journalism in incredibly difficult circumstances. Um, yeah, so they, they do a phenomenal work um, 
by any standard, but particularly given the, the sort of constraints that, that they face. Thank you. Thank you both. Remember to get your questions into the chat. Just pop them in there now. Josh, some questions for you. Amy Bainbridge from the ABC. Hello, Amy. How are you going? Says, hi, Josh. Which tools did you use for data scraping? Um, so there's not a huge there's not a huge difference between a bunch of tools, I think. I think it's whatever works. But personally, like the Guardian mostly runs on Python and JavaScript. So basically, I was just, you know, tooling together some Python libraries. Um, and they're the ones that, you know, if you just Google, like, how do you web scrape in Python? They're the ones you'll get, like Selenium and requests and stuff like that. Cool. Thank you. For those of you watching in Australia, uh, I'm looking at, uh, through Jay and I, running some more data training courses in early in the new year. So do message me uh, through the, the conference platform if you are interested to know more about those. And for our Pacific um, journalism friends as well, I'd like to extend that invitation to you too. Jemima, a question for Josh and Kate. Which of the data visualisations attracted the most interest from readers? I'm very interested in this myself. And what insights do you have as to the demographics of those readers? Who are you reaching with this stuff? Go oh, on, Kate. Okay. Um, I've been dogged in. Um, Jemima, that's a good question, but a difficult one to answer because on the opening day we launched one big juicy interactive piece that had quite a few of the visualizations on the same article. So we we didn't really break that down into people spent a lot of time on the map that showed the flows of um, trade versus the interactive map that showed like uh, cleared logging, cleared land. Um, so a slightly tricky one to answer. Um, but yes, in terms of who we reach, um, we reach a lot of people. We have very good numbers for this series and for the Pacific Project in general. It compares very favourably um, with other um, sections of, of The Guardian. I don't, I'm not allowed to share exact numbers, but um, it does well. Um, we have a very significant readership in Australia, New Zealand, um, in the Pacific, given its small size, um, percentage-wise, um, it makes up quite a large percentage of our readers, given how small a percentage of the world it is, um, and the UK, Europe um, and the US to some extent, especially when it's a US-related country, you know, a US territory or, or a history with the US. Fantastic. What are you I, saying, Josh? I add to that, yeah, so I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know... Um, you know, exact exact figures with this series because also a lot of charts and stuff, there were multiple on a page and I, I don't know which ones they were looking at. But I can say, so just like, you know, um, maps go nuts. <laughs> this is this is kind of a, a truism for across the garden. Or everywhere I've worked, maps go nuts. So I, I think it comes back to, you know, some of the stuff that I was talking about is I... <sighs> Bar charts and sankeys and stuff, they, they can be quite abstract. I can't quite, you know, I know China's a country and I can see China labeled on the thing and it goes over, but there's something just a bit more tangible about, you know, like I'm in that country. I can I can orient myself. So I I, I just and, and that was also what I was getting on like Twitter and stuff. The people, the stuff people were screenshotting and tagging me in on were the maps. So I would just say the maps. Writing that down now, Josh, um, when doing data visualisations, maps go nuts. Great. That is such great advice. Uh, hi to Ben Bluer again from Island Sun. He says, uh, this is a, a really um, yeah, pointy question, I think. He says, I think one of the toughest countries in the world to do investigative reporting in is the Solomon Islands. Many times journalists and reporters who dig into logging or mining are intimidated not only from the loggers and the landowners but also some government officials and the issues have led journalists to drop the news. So my question is, any advice on how to approach such, such issues and is there any other best practices? And I would add in there, is this some a way in which a collaboration with an offshore uh, outlet can actually help. Yeah, that's such a tough one, Ben. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Solomon Islands is so difficult. Um, I have, I know of a Solomon Islands reporter who did an amazing bit of work on, not for The Guardian, um, for a Solomon outlet um, on logging and mining and was, after it was published, was 
sort of kidnapped by the company and locked in a shipping container and held there for three hours and interrogated by them after publication. Um, yeah, it's really, really difficult. I mean, I would say uh, do, make, do the things you can do that are in your power, best practice reporting, um, making sure your rights of reply are ironclad and solid, um, that you've been to everyone who you possibly need to um, for comment, that you have the documents, that you have the paper trail, that your reporting is as legally watertight as you can make it. Um, that's within your power. Um, a collaboration can help. We, we do find that, that um, there, are, there are times when journalists will come to us with a story and say, can you work with me on it um, so that we uh, the partnership gives them a feeling of some protection, like Bernadette's work um, said. But also, you know, we can bring to our to the table some of our reporting, some of our um, yeah journalists to work with, editors to work with, and legal team to work with as well. But I mean, the the thing that is just really difficult is when there's stuff that's sort of extrajudicial, right? Like that it's not to, it's not a matter of you've you've done everything perfectly, it's all legal, it's all legally perfect, and you still get a government or a company that threatens to kneecap you. Like that's a really, really difficult thing to do. And I, I don't, I don't have an answer. Um, I'd be very interested to hear from you what, what your assessment of that is and your assessment of that risk is, um, because I just think that's a really, really difficult one. Yeah, drop your thoughts into the chat, Ben. That'd be appreciated because this is a conversation after all. Thank you for the observation. Hi to Jemima Garrett, uh, who says, thank you to Jay and I, The Guardian, and to Kate, Bernadette and Josh and other reporters for all the on-ground breaking work done by the Pacific Project. It's hard to make a profit with this kind of reporting. What future do you see for the project over the next two to three years? Will it continue? How will it develop, Bernadette? How would you like to see the Pacific Project develop, especially in light of uh, new initiatives such as the US Investigative Journalism Initiative, which is being led by OCCRP? And a hi to Aubrey Belford, who I think is uh, probably in on this session today. I saw him signed up. So that's a lot of questions from Jemima. I wonder if we will just sort of tackle on that first. How do you make it profitable? How do you fund this? And and uh, how would you like to see this develop? Uh, well, I think that first one is maybe for me, but it, I think it's actually above above my pay grade there, Jemima, um, in terms of how long it goes for and what the future of it looks like. Um, that's, yeah, I think that's a that's a sort of J&I slash, um, you know, Lenore Taylor question and conversation. I, it's been an amazing project. It's, I think, really increased um as you've been kind enough to sort of share with me privately as well that it's increased the profile of Pacific journalists and the profile of the Pacific in general among other media in a way that I think has been incredibly beneficial and has had this sort of um spill on effect um so I'd love to see it continue in the in in a form I I'm would love to keep keep doing it but in terms of how it goes I'm I'm not sure what that looks like I wonder if the larger question is really around philanthropy and philanthropy funding public interest journalism. Is that the kind of thing? I mean, I, Guardian Australia is in itself a very interesting example because, you know, Jay and I is only a small one of uh, the donors that donates to, to Guardian. And uh, I see that it's quite a different model to the old advertising driven model or advertising dependent model that um, many of the others have lots of us uh, you know have our own subscriptions but I also see that there are donors do we think that this is a model which is on the rise which is necessary um, I, I don't know what's your feeling about um, about donations and philanthropy and journalism generally Yes, I think it's it's almost certainly um, on the rise. Um, I think when done well, um, as I think Jay and I does well, uh, it can be incredibly beneficial um, when it is a case of there being a lot of ed editorial independence and Jay and I is very good about that. You know, um, they, you know, you guys doing a fantastic job of sort of letting us follow our news noses um, and to, to see where, where it takes us. Um, I think that can be incredibly uh, beneficial and, and given, you know, the state of, of flux that the media industry is in, looking for new sources of revenue like this um, is, I think, probably essential um, and essential for a project like this that is is expensive, you know, like it's um, how do you cover the Pacific? You can have what, three, four, five 
correspondence in different countries that's incredibly expensive or you have or you fly people in and out a lot that's also expensive but also has the downside of they're not on the ground to start they're not locals who know the story or you have um, a project like this that um, pays well um, pays a fair rate to Pacific journalists and has a Pacific editor and that costs money too so it's um yeah, this sort of reporting does cost money. You know, there were months and months and months of work on the Pacific Plunder series. Um, so, yeah, finding ways to fund that um, and looking to philanthropy as an option, I think, is kind of essential. Um, yeah, I, I, in terms of how it evolves, Bernadette, what would you say about how you think the um, you'd like to see the project go? What I, I mean, in terms of my vision, my priority for the next sort of year of the project is more major investigations and we've got a few sort of in the pipeline we recently our recent podcast series was fantastic and was really really successful I'd love to see about doing another one of those and also we started doing more um, toward the end of this year of getting reporters to do reporting trips throughout their countries far more getting to the remoter islands um, and that was very powerful I'd love to see more of that as well those are my you know priorities for the next little while but Bernadette, what would you like to see? Um, I, I would like to see it continue over the next decade. And um, yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm uh, as I mentioned, I'm a media trainer. So I always, um, I always mention about how Pacific Project is a great model um, in terms of collaboration and you know, in terms of byline. I have said it in some webinar that I work with. Sometimes I work with international agencies. I get to be a fixer of uh, some news agencies that comes to Palau. And then I don't get the credit. I don't get a byline. And also um, and also the pay is not worth it. But I could say the Pacific project um, is well worth it, very competitive. And yeah, I always highlight how good a model this is. Like for story grants, we should follow the Pacific project model. And, you know, we have a smaller newsroom. The pay is not that great. And I'm a freelance reporter, so I'm hustling all the time. So um, when, you, when you work with someone or with our organization that appreciates you by paying you well, by giving you a byline, I think the more you wanted to work with them. So I want to see the Pacific Project uh, out I want to say unlimited, but I don't think like a big um, resource grant of, um, of assistance to the local reporters. And we have amazing local reporters. We have amazing Pacific reporters. And although we're separated geographically, we have, and, and I think the other Pacific journalists will agree with me, including Jemima and Ben, that we have this sort of rapport with each other. We talk to each other about every other week. We collaborate with each other. We ask each other questions. So yeah, I think I want to see it you know, grow and more younger journalists um, joining. It's, I think that's a really good note to finish on. Thank you, Bernadette. I think that there's a massive future for reporting on what's going on in the Pacific. And I want to really at this point say a big thank you to our um, our three panellists today, Kate Lyons, Bernadette, Carrion and Josh Nicholas. You've just done a fantastic job. I know that there are a couple of other questions. Uh, Leon Buan from Philippines Rappler has a question for you, Bernadette, but I wonder if you might connect uh, with each other via the conference platform because we're running a little low on time now. But it's been really great to have such an active uh, conversation. I want to point you to a couple of other things. If you enjoyed uh, this session, there's a few other things coming up today that might be good for you. I know that at the same time as this, unfortunately, uh, up against each other, there was a session called Asia Pacific collaborations but later on today that's going to be available as video on demand so you'll be able to look at that it's been hosted by Emma Connors and some fantastic speakers in that but in uh, a couple of hours time in two and a half hours time there will be a networking session looking at cross-border projects in Asia and the Pacific so if you would like to get involved in a cross-border project or you want to pitch a cross-border project then I would encourage you to sign up for that one as well and uh, just a last little uh, plug for 
for the Judith Nielsen Institute. We have a terrific podcast, uh, which is called Journo, and our latest uh, edition is out today, and it's looking at reporting on uh, on COVID-19 and the effects that that's had on all of us. So I encourage you to just go and have a look at that in your podcast. It's available in all the podcast players, and it's perfectly free. This is the fifth episode, and every one of them hopefully is going to be good for you. It's designed for all of us as journalists. So that's my recommendation for today. Thank you very much for joining this session and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the conference. Good luck. Thanks, everybody.